morning, everybody, and welcome to the next installment of our Meet Your Case Manager. We are excited to talk about culture shock today. But before we get into our webinar, I just wanted to introduce some new faces that haven't been on with us before. Really, really excited for a couple of people on today. Number one, we'd like to introduce Ms. Stephanie Tucker, who is our new um, associate director for our candidate support specialist. And she is just new to this role and very, very excited to be working with our nurses that have newly arrived in the US. We'd like to say hi to Christian Anguiano, our associate director in Idaho office. I think we've seen Christian before. And we are also having Molly Lanahan, one of our relocation coordinators actually one of the best. And I think she might be having some technical difficulties, but hopefully she'll be able to hop on here pretty quick. So today we wanted to really go over, there's Miss Molly. Hi, Molly. We wanted to go over coping with culture shock. We really felt it was um, a super important and pressing, urgent topic that the case managers really have seen a lot of questions about, a lot of concerns about, and it's really important that we assist you in every way that we can with your transition into the U.S. So I'm going to kick it over to Molly to start us off. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, Marlo. Good morning, everyone. Um, as we begin our discussion about culture shock, I want everyone to really keep in mind that this is completely normal. <clears throat> and I think everyone will really experience this to some degree. It is completely normal um, when you're coming to a new culture in a new area to feel disoriented or overwhelmed and this is a whole new way of life and um, that is completely normal. You know, there's many ways that we can cope with this and as we kind of go into our discussion today, we're going to talk about some of the ways that you can um, cope with culture shock. Um, some great tips and tricks for um, settling into your new area are talking with other nurses um, who have gone through similar experiences as you and um, who are um, or currently going through the same experience as you. You know, this is a great way to get advice from people who have already been through it. And it's a great way to make connections um, while you're settling into your new area. Here in the United States, there are many different groups um, to associate yourself with and different communities um, to immerse yourself in. Um, for example, the um, National Federation of Filipino American Association um, is a big one here in America. I know that there's one Texas, they have one in the Midwest, you're on the East Coast. Um, so there are many different groups that you can associate yourself with just to find other people who may be going through similar experience and find community um, within your new location. Um, things such as decorating objects that remind you of home or um, surrounding yourself with uh, things that uh, remind you of friends and family back home are great ways to feel included and um, a reminder that just because you're in a new area, doesn't mean that you don't have a piece of home with you. Um, and being excited for your new area. Find things you want to accomplish and find things that you want to do. Exploring museums or parks or other local attractions is a great way um, to get excited about your new area um, and location. Um, and having something to look forward to and having new things to experience um, will really help with uh, culture shock. And we have a great link here in our, our presentation um, that goes over understanding culture shock and understanding the culture um, here in the United States. Um, so we have that here for you all. Um, but with that being said, I'm going to pass some time over to Christian. Great. Thank you so much, Molly. I really appreciate it. Um, I think the, the biggest thing with, you know, with, with culture shock is, is understanding that we're here to assist you. Um, you know, we want to be able to be here and, and help you as much as we possibly can. Um, and with that being said, we do have um, a lot of different resources and people that you can reach out to, such as your case manager, your relocation coordinator, or even the candidate support specialist that, that some of you um, will be working with and some of you that are already working with. Um, so, you know, just reach out to any one of us. We'll be more than happy to help out as much as we can. You know, uh, Molly, we've, we've spoken with Molly with a couple of candidates to provide different resources, um, different, um, you know, groups and associations that will be able to assist and kind of bringing that camaraderie within that location to a lot of our nurses. So, 
um, we're always here to assist and, and help find um, different different ways to help you feel supported. So just keep that in mind. Always feel free to reach out to us. We're always here to help. Um, with that being said, um, we in order to kind of make your experience when you're here in the U.S. Um, an even better experience, it is very important that you're arriving in the U.S. with the personal finances to be able to um, you know, afford your rent, afford food, afford different things while you're here before you receive your first paycheck from your employer. Um, a lot of times, you know, people will come and they don't realize that um, they're not going to be receiving a paycheck immediately when they arrive. Um, it does take a little bit, you know, for a candidate to receive their social security card. It takes a little bit for them to receive their license. Um, so please keep that in mind as you're going through the immigration process that once you arrive in the U.S., it isn't an automatic you're going to start receiving funds from your employer because you haven't started working yet. Um, you will be able to receive a reimbursement upon working, um, but, you know, just keep in mind that we do have to provide enough funds for us to be able to, you know, make it through um those those first couple of weeks those first couple of months before we actually begin working and um, we highly recommend that you save a minimum of three thousand to five thousand dollars per person um that that is the minimum we would recommend that you try to save as much as you possibly can um because you know we we want you to feel you know stable and we want you to feel comfortable while you're here in the u.s um, but that's just the minimum that we would um, ask that you try to save as much as possible. I see Marla. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I had a, a thought that just popped up on that. We find even those of us who are, you know, United States citizens, we find that emergencies pop up all the time. So those funds that we, you know, ask everybody to try and set aside. First of all, we know how challenging and difficult it can be. We know that finances are very, very tight for many of our nurses, and we respect you guys so much for all the hard work that you do, taking care of the people around the world. But there are emergencies that pop up, and sometimes you can't always plan for those. So you really need to try and set aside your money as soon as possible. What do you think, Christian? How long or how far in advance do you think we should be preparing to put that money aside? Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, I would say that as soon as you start the immigration process, you should probably begin saving your money. Um, you know, the longer that you have to be able to save your money, the more funds that you'll ultimately be able to have when you come to the U.S. Um, so my recommendation is as soon as you start this immigration process, I would highly recommend that you begin saving your money. Um, if you haven't started saving any money to come to the U.S., I would recommend that you do that as soon as possible. Um, again, like I said, the more money that you have when you come to the U.S., the more comfortable you will also be when you come. You won't have to worry about the financial burdens that, that some of us might experience. Um, like Marla was saying, there are emergencies that arise. Um, and you'll be able to have the funds to be able to, you know, take care of those emergencies, whatever it might be, if there are any. And if there aren't, then you have extra funds to be able to, you know, kind of do what Molly was saying, go out and, and visit different places, um, do different things to help you feel more comfortable. Um, a lot of the, the struggles that, that a lot of the nurses face is that, they haven't been able to save enough money. Um, and it's not necessarily because they weren't able to, it's more along the lines that they just didn't save the money beforehand. Um, so which is why we're talking about this now. It's really important that we're saving that money as soon as possible and as much money as possible. So that way, when you do come to the US, you're not having to struggle and feel like you're um, not financially stable when you first come. Um, so if you have any questions about that or if you want any help and any assistance in, in understanding more about that, please feel free to reach out to your case manager and they'll be able to kind of explain that a little bit more if you need to. 
Um, the other financial um, burdens that there are is the green card fee. Um, the green card fee is something that you have to pay in order to be able to receive your green card. This needs to be paid before you travel to the U.S. Um, the green card fee is $220 per person. Um, so for each dependent that you have, including yourself, you're going to have to pay $200, $220 to be able to receive a green card um, when you arrive in the U.S. Um, and then for airfare for any dependents that you have, um, we're, we're seeing that it's approximately $900 to $1,400 on a one-way ticket to the U.S. from, from your you know, from the country that you're coming from. Um, so keep that in mind as well, that um, your your flights will be taken care of by the employer. However, your dependents flight will not be, and you will have to pay for your own dependents flight to the U.S. Um, any, any other updates? Yeah, Marlo. Yeah, a thought just occurred to me. I think there's been a big change in the cost of airfare. And I wanted to ask Molly really quickly, over the last few months, do you think you've noticed that that cost of airfare has increased? Because if it has, maybe we should be advising to put away just a little bit more. What have you seen? I think that it really depends upon a few factors, Marlo. Um, the time of year can really impact the price of flight tickets during the summer. Tickets can be more expensive than what you would see kind of in the uh, late winter or spring season. Um, during holidays, such as, you know, right now during Thanksgiving and during Christmas <clears throat> and other major holidays that occur during um, here in the United States, flight tickets will um, be a lot higher. Um, but I would say that anywhere between 19 and 1400 or 900 and 1400 dollars is about average. Um, just keep in mind that if you're coming during those peak seasons that flight tickets can be more expensive. Um, and also, if you're planning on coming quickly, um, tickets can absolutely be more expensive. Right. Yep, learn not the hard way with all the traveling we do. Golly, the, those ticket costs have gone way up. Thanks, Molly, for hopping on with that. I appreciate it. All right, and then I'll move over to the next one here. Um, this next um, tip, I guess, that we have is, is for safety. Um, and so regardless of, you know, where you are in the United States, there is one number that you can call to be able to get in contact with the police department, the fire department, or any medical emergency that you have. Um, and that number is 911. It is very important that you understand and know that number because this is the number that you can use for any type of dangerous situation, any type of medical emergency. Um, please reach out to this number if you notice that there are any um, anything that, that you might be, you know, um, kind of feeling uneasy about or whatever it might be, um, this number is, uh, is accessible to everyone um, here in the United States. Um, another safety tip is the United States requires all passengers in a vehicle to wear a seatbelt. Um, this, is, this is kind of a, a very little one. However, it can be something that, that can prevent a lot of um, financial burden. Um, tickets can be expensive if you happen to be pulled over by a police officer and you're not wearing your seatbelt. Um, they will issue a ticket because of that. Um, so to help prevent any financial burdens, we also recommend that you wear a seatbelt at all times when you're traveling in a vehicle, and that includes all of your dependents, any friends or family. Um, never walk at night without a flashlight or reflective clothing. Um, it can get very dark here, and there's some areas that don't have street lights. So um, it's very important that we're, we're making sure that we're visible to all people that are driving. We're visible to anybody. Um, so that way, one, we are visible to everyone so we don't get hit. But then two, also so that way um, we are able to kind of make sure that we're taking the precautions that, that we know where we're going we understand the you know the destination that we have in mind and we get there safely and then the last tip that we have here is just to be mindful of your social security number um, this number is a very important number um, it is it is a number that you'll be using throughout your entire life here in the united states 
Um, it really is applicable to everything that you'll be doing, whether it's with your employer, whether it's you know renting a, a, an apartment, a house, buying a house, whatever it might be. Your social security number is very important and it will be used um, throughout the remainder of your life here in the U.S., um, especially here in the U.S., you'll, you'll be needing it. So um, anything else anybody would like to add to these safety tips? I will say it's a lot different driving in the United States than it is in the Philippines. My recent trip there was really interesting. I did not drive. We had some colleagues that drove us around the beautiful city, but it was really congested. And I have to say it was a little nerve wracking. So we're hoping that you will find driving perhaps in the U.S. a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> I know that it felt good to be back here again. Uh, reflective clothing is really, really important. It just really makes you more visible. And um, I wouldn't encourage a lot of people, if they're single, to be out late, late in the evening. It's just better to, to be mindful of, of a good time to be out and about, and, you know, safety in numbers. We don't want to make anybody nervous or afraid of being in the U.S. I think it's probably the same with all the countries around the world. You just want to make sure that you're cautious that you're aware of your surroundings around your personal surroundings and that you um, just are mindful to take all the safety precautions as you're learning to live life in the U.S. You know, as you're adjusting to how the cultures work and just the, the general nuance of the city that you're in, it will be very different from what you're used to. And please reach out to a colleague, reach out to a friend you know, reach out to people that will be supportive and, and help you through this time. Definitely. Thank you, Marlo. I'll go ahead and, and turn the time over to Stephanie. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited to be here to talk with you. So driving is very important in the United States. Unless you live in a big city, it is very difficult to get around. I don't know uh, a lot of people realize how large the United States is. It's not like Europe where you can find a lot of travel easily. So we need to, having a car is a necessity. And luckily we have Molly who knows everything about how to get a car. And we do have some great uh, contacts with AutoSource and all of that. So we do have a lot of resources for you. But one thing we do recommend, if you do not have, you know, you're if, to get a valid driver's license in the United States, a lot of times you'll need your social security number, but you can get an international driving permit before coming to the United States. And you have to get it before you come here. And if you don't know how to drive, I'd recommend you know, at least trying to learn how to drive before you come. So we can help you with that. If looking at the slide here, you will probably, I would go and research where I'm going to live and see what, uh, going to the DMV, it's kind of like a joke in the United States. Um, if anybody else can agree with me on that, <laughs> you know, it, it's not an easy thing to do. So to, to be more aware and to research, you know, what you're getting into is a really good thing. So because more than likely, you're going to have to take a written test as well as a driving test. And don't worry, all of us get nervous. I had to take a new test when I moved to another state. So if you go to like, if you see on the link over here, It'll help you, you know, find online driving courses or if you need information on that. And we also can help you with that. Molly, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, I do. I just want to say that, um, you know, as you're going through your immigration process, um, as you're kind of re getting ready to transition um, into the United States and you're preparing for your arrival, you will, will be assigned a relocation coordinator. Um, we have many resources for driving on how to get a vehicle, um, how to secure an auto loan, what is an auto loan, um, free driver's tests online, um, as well as um, get information on getting an international driver's um, permit, if that is something that you're interested. We have a full 
documents on that. Um, we even have a partnership with International Auto Source who can help you with the whole car buying process as well as getting your license in your assigned state. Um, so if you're in need of any of those resources, uh, please feel free to reach out to your relocation coordinator um, or your case manager to be um, pointed in the right direction. Thanks, Molly and Steph. I think it's probably my turn. Um, I, I always like to add, I think I've said it in just about every webinar we've done, uh, being an immigrant myself, I've experienced all of these things. And even though I've immigrated from Canada and I've seen some of my Canadian nurses, I love that you guys put the country that you're tuning in from. So if you haven't had a chance to do that quite yet, pop that in the chat. And I, I have seen some of my nurses. So hi to Rexy and hi to Narissa and hi to all you guys that are tuned in. Even though coming from Canada, it was, I didn't even know what the DMV was. That is an experience. Let me tell you, I walked into a giant room and there was probably, it was the DMV in Las Vegas, Nevada, because that's where I immigrated to. And it was full of about 250 people. And it was really, really overwhelming really overwhelming. And I hadn't been prepared ahead of time. My husband had not warned me what that experience would be like. So just do a little research ahead of time. Just make sure that you know where all your local offices are, where, where, um, where the local DMV is. Sometimes they will allow you to do things like uh, set yourself up in a queue online. I don't know what, whether they have any of those online queues anymore. Do you know anything about that, Molly, by chance? Yes, absolutely. Many lo um, local DMVs that are really near to your facility location, you can actually set an appointment ahead of time, um, just so you can have a set appointment, go in, check in, um, and be seen in an orderly fashion. <laughs> you can also walk in as well, though, if you need. Yeah, if there's anything like orderly fashion at the DMV, but <laughs> And usually tensions run a bit high, so you're going to have a lot of stressed out individuals all coming together at one time. And I find that the DMV um, attendees are a little bit on the serious side, so I tend to like to crack some jokes every once in a while. It didn't go over very well with my DMV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, why is that? I mean, maybe it's just the, the environment there that makes it so intense. I don't know. Yeah. It is. It's intense. I think they were stressed out. They did not smile. And I learned really early on, don't do that. So thanks. Thanks, Stephanie, for talking about driving. All right. It's my turn. We're going to talk about schools, banks, churches, shopping centers. We as case managers get asked these questions a lot. I know when I was working uh, predominantly just in case management, you know, a year or so ago, I was trying to go into the city that my nurses were assigned to. And this was long before we had amazing relocation people like Molly, when we didn't quite have those resources yet, we would go into the cities that our nurses were going to and we would research. And again, that would be new to me, not coming from the United States. I had learned quite a few things about all of these major cities. So I would go in and look up school districts. So I would look up local churches hey, the first thing I put on there was the local Walmart. And I think Walmart is a universal symbol of comfort and accessibility and affordability for everybody. So I would put together just a little quick document and it would have links to all of the school systems and you know district headquarters, as well as any of the, lo like all of the local churches. It, a lot of times, our nurses don't really attend church or don't have a faith or a denomination, but I find that just reaching out to those groups is really excellent support if you don't ha <clears throat> happen to have a colleague or a, a friend, a nurse that you know that is already working in your area. I find that those churches can be a really, really big support network and they often have uh, support groups for people to be able to attend. Shopping centers, uh, there are amazing malls in Manila. Those, they were everywhere. I never, I could chuck a rock and hit a mall. It was amazing. I can tell you there's probably not that many malls in some of the more rural areas that our nurses are going to. So you're gonna rely maybe heavily on Target or Walmart or your grocery stores really vary 
on what end of the country that you're in. I lived in the West for many years. And so we had Albertsons and then I moved to the East and nobody's heard of Albertsons over here. So just do your research on grocery stores. Again, I'm gonna put in a plug for Walmart because they usually have a grocery section and it's usually really, really affordable and cheap. So <clears throat> probably do your research on the cost of produce and you have a lot of time Again, I'm going to say prep ahead of time, well, well in advance, months before you arrive to really look at the city and the area that you're going in and all of those resources available. Um, I even sent the link for the, golly, what was it? It was a, um, like the visitor center. Uh, oftentimes, if you go to your visitor center in the local area, it will have a lot of interesting tips and, and maps and pamphlets and things that will be helpful for your area. So there are websites, there's www.greatschools.org and schooldigger.com. So please use these trusted and true websites that we've popped on here. Childcare, that's one thing I didn't touch on. Uh, so many of our nurses are coming with their little ones and their spouses are not immigrating with them. They're immigrating at a later time. So it can be really challenging because they are like a single parent and they need to find some childcare services. So by all means, please, please go on the childcare.gov site and it will give you a lot of different resources. Does anybody wanna hop on with that before we talk about food? Because I did see Amy Reisman was asking our nurses what everybody's favorite food was. And I'm looking at pizza, cheeseburgers, all sorts of things. I do All right. Well, oh, sorry, Marlo. Um, well, let's go into food. I do have something to say about the food. Yeah, go ahead. You hop on for a step. Okay. So just so you know, um, my I'm half Chinese. So I'm, I hope that you realize that American versions of Asian food is a lot different from what you probably are used to. Uh, things become Americanized a lot of times. Uh, and, but but there's good news. You know, there's there's always, uh, you can find restaurants that have, uh, I would say more authentic cuisine, but I think it's a good for you to know that what you might be used to is a little bit different here in the United States. We, we're so large that a lot of our food gets shipped early when it's not ripe. So if you're used to having like fresh, fresh fruit and vegetables, uh, a lot of times, you know, you may not find that here, but you know, don't, you know, don't be worried. You know, you'll be able to find things that you'll be able to to like and to eat. It just may be more of a search than what you're used to. Yeah, I didn't realize how important food was. <clears throat> I'm usually go with the flow. I eat just about anything, so I try to be flexible with wherever I'm at. But I will say I ran into a lot of nurses that that was a big trial for yes, them trying is. to yeah mm -hmm. trying to adjust to the the new ways the new tastes the different options as well as the lack of options. So Steph brought up you know being Asian herself that it can be a little bit of a different style of Asian cooking and a lot of our nurses that are used to that are going to maybe smaller cities that don't necessarily even have that as an option. And so it was a really big challenge for some of our nurses. They didn't feel like they, Molly talked about earlier on, you know, have a little piece of home with you. So put something up in your surroundings that make you feel like you're part of home. And I think food really equates to feeling like you're home. So I have, and I love this so much about our nurses. And I think everybody here has experienced this. I have seen our nurses get together once they arrive in the US and they they look one another up and they they do things together. They socialize, they have dinners, they have potlucks, they go out to dinner together and they do it as a, a almost like an enormous family. And I think there's a, a lot of people in the United States that could learn from from that. I think it's been a wonderful support to see them come together and and they go to the parks and they take pictures together and then they send them to us. And then as case managers, we get all these beautiful pictures of 
of you guys, your families, and with all the other nurses. And you need to know that we just, we love it. We, it gets posted most of the time, relocation gets those. And then we all comment about how amazing and wonderful and how proud we are of everybody. And so I think the common theme to a lot of this today is please try and reach out to a colleague, to a nurse, try and have your person, your support person and find food that you like. I guarantee you that it's so diverse here in the U.S. You're going to find something. Also, another trick that I did not know is that if you're at a restaurant and you really want to order something that isn't on the menu, you can still ask. Mm -hmm. There are people with special diets. I mean, golly, we're looking at a world now of lactose intolerant and gluten free and all sorts of things and different food allergies. And if you don't see it on the menu, don't panic. A lot of times these restaurants can make up whatever it is that you need and, and do it in a way however you need it to be. So there are also FYI secret menus at McDonald's that I also did not know about. Does anybody know about the secret menus at McDonald's? No. You, are you serious? The Canadian had to tell you guys this? Yeah. So look it up. Let's look at Google. Um, I believe Google was a, a big old reference. We call it Dr. Google here. Google everything. But just for fun, Google McDonald's secret menu. You can ask for really weird and wild stuff that's super fun and maybe do it as an outing one night, you know, mm -hmm. just go to McDonald's and ask for something really crazy and fun. Anyway, try and find things that are going to be uplifting, supporting, um, things that will make you feel connected. I think if you can find that one thing that connects you to your new job, to your um, new working colleagues, to your new church, all of those things, it will be um, a much better transition. And and I think we're probably at the end. I think we're at the Q&A portion, which is where I kick it over to my most favorite immigrant of all, and that is CJ. Thank you, you're on mute, CJ. Yeah, you're on mute, CJ. Can't hear you. He's gonna hop out, come back in. I always find it super funny when our IT has the IT problems. <laughs> <laughs> so while we're waiting for CJ to hop back on, I think we had, as a group, discussed a few questions. Oh, CJ's back. Hello. Yay, we have audio. Hi, CJ. Cool, cool. All right, so thank you so much, Marlo. I really appreciate that. I'm an immigrant. You yeah. are, totally. Don't <laughs> tell you. any of my nurses that. <laughs> All right, awesome, awesome. Yep. And yeah, I re I'm, I'm really excited for this webinar. And I think this one is really a great webinar. And, and to add to the food that Marla just, just mentioned a while ago, here in the United States, you won't feel like homesick when it comes to food because you can see a lot of, you know, your you can see a lot of groceries of i'm an asian so i can like like last week me and my wife went to like four uh asian grocery stores here in the city to you know check out some mm -hmm. some meat dishes for like filipino food that we are preparing because she has celebrated her birthday last week so um it's not really a problem when it comes to food here in the, the united states and uh, you can see a lot of restaurants like Indian food, uh, Thai, Vietnamese, Ch Chinese food. So you won't have any problems when it comes to food here in the United States. I assure you. I assure you of that. Okay. So <laughs> without further ado, um, also, I I'm Carmel or CJ Campos. So I'll be with you with the Q&A today with uh, our webinar. So I'm really excited. Um, I can see questions from the chat. And uh, yeah, let's start with the first question. Um, first one is, uh, let's see this one. Can you tell us about the symptoms of culture shock? Hmm. Who wants to hop on that one? Well, when I moved, uh, 
I moved out of the United States and moved to another country. And you just, one of the symptoms that I felt is that you feel alone. And I think that that is important to realize that you're not alone and that we have so much many more resources now than what we used to have. So when you start to feel those feelings, I think Molly, um, Molly, I think we have something with uh, the relocation, right? That kind of goes over with the symptoms of. Absolutely. Yep. We have a whole um, USA arrival guide and culture shock is a big section of that. <clears throat> and it goes over um, what to expect and um, kind of going over um, that this is something that you're likely to feel as you come to the new country. And, you know, when you're feeling certain ways or feeling certain things that you may not be used to or maybe new to you, um, that that's a good time to think about doing something different to make changes in your life to um, support yourself as you're going through this change, finding a new community um, or finding help. There's support groups all over here in the United States and it just takes looking them up or reaching out to your team here at Worldwide um, to help you find those, to help you feel included and combat things like loneliness. Yeah, I'm going to say anxiety is a big one as well. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of our nurses uh, that have had to leave a spouse behind that is maybe followed to join coming at a later time. So we see fear. We mm -hmm. see anxiety. We even see depression. And again, this is why these support groups are really, really important. And also reach out to your staff. I used to work in the hospital for many, many years. And they were like a family of sorts for me. Oftentimes we would you know, go out after a very long and difficult day and just sit down and talk and maybe, you know, have a, a pop and just talk about life in general and our families. We try not to talk about work, but I think the sooner that you can find a person to connect with, it will really help to alleviate that anxiety and, and sometimes that depression. Also, I think we didn't talk about it, but find yourself a good physician. Did we talk about having a, looking for a good doctor? That'd be, I would say, number one thing, once your uh, healthcare kicks in, be looking for a primary care physician. You guys are healthcare providers. I think you know what I mean. All right, awesome. Thank you. Thank you for those great answers. Okay, so next one. Um, it said, I am not good in conversing in English. So do you think I'll have a culture shock because of my language or any language barrier? Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and kind of speak to this one. Um, I, I will say that, you know, there, there, there are people and, you know, you'll hopefully have other nurses within the facility that will be able to communicate with you in your home language. Um, but if there aren't, um, it is very important to try to, to get as fluent as you can in English. Um, because uh, that's the main language that's used in the U.S., um, especially with patients. Um, patients that come in are going to be mainly using English. Um, and then a lot of the um, kind of people that you're going to be working with are going to be using English. So um, we do have an ESL course that we have um, an, ES an ESL teacher for. Her name's Carrie Cooper. Um, she is um, working with us and she'll be able to provide any assistance that you need, any um, courses that you might need to be able to kind of be more pro efficient with English. Um, so we do have that resource. I would highly recommend if you don't feel comfortable in speaking in English, then um, please reach out to your case manager so we can get you connected with um, with Carrie. So that way you can kind of work and practice your English a little bit more so you feel a little bit more comfortable when you come to the U.S. Yeah, she's our local celebrity. I think she has her own Facebook Live. I believe it's called Carrie's Corner. Mm -hmm. So everybody be looking for Carrie Cooper. She has several excellent courses and classes and she does speaking classes. Please, as Christian said, if you need her her uh, contact information, just reach out to your case manager and they'll connect you with Carrie Cooper and she will really, really help you with the language portion of your transition. Great, awesome, yeah. And also one tip, because I've been here for like nine months already. One tip when, when it comes to conversing in, in 
the English language, just be confident. Just be confident when you're speaking. That will really help you. All right, next question is, uh, what should I do if I'm the only international nurse in my facility? Ooh. That's a that's a good one. Um, I know we're talking about culture shock. It's tough because culturally, the way you've lived your life and the things that you do will be very different from everybody else on the on the staff. It's really easy for us to say, "Be brave, be confident, don't worry, just put yourself out there," and that is a very scary thing to do. I will say by experience that if you reach out and make that effort to connect with the nurses, with your colleagues, they should reciprocate in kind. They will befriend you. They will work with you. Please just reach out, let them know, hey, you know, my English isn't so great. Could we maybe sit down and have a conversation? It, it's tough being the only person of your nationality and from your country where you're at, but just be brave, be courageous reach out to those people that you work with and they will be there for you. And then I think that's also where those support groups come in, right? You know, if, if unfortunately, you know, you are placed in a situation where, you know, you're the only Filipino nurse or you're the only Nigerian nurse or whatever it might be, wherever you're coming from. Uh, um, I think there, there's always, like Molly was talking about, there's always support groups. There's always... Um, different associations, different groups that, that will be able to be there to support you, um, whether that be virtually or whether that be in person. Um, there's always people that, that are here to support you. And, you know, we're always here to support you and assist you. Um, so if there's ever anything that we can do, always feel free to reach out to us and we'll be more than happy to assist you. But also, you know, try to try to look for those groups, try to see if there's any anybody around in the area that, you know, even though they might not be working in the same facility or even working in the same profession, they'll still be able to, you know, you'll still be able to make those connections with people here in the U.S. All right. Thank you. So with that, like connecting with, you know, you know, groups and community, here's a question. So how do I find an engagement group or community? That's a great question. I think, like Marlo had mentioned earlier, Dr. Google is a great resource to be looking up. Um, you have your support team here at Worldwide that is happy to help you look for support groups in your community. Um, and also getting out on um, social media and Facebook, you know, be cautious, be safe. Um, but there's a lot of communities out there. There's a lot of um, pages that you can join with um, different events and activities going on, different festivals and occasions. Um, and I think that that is a fantastic way to kind of immerse yourself in the community and find local support groups. Yeah, I agree. Our reloc first of all, I just can't even sing the praises of our relocation people enough. They are the lifeline for our nurses from that point where they leave their home country and they have to come here. So I don't want to put the burden on them, but reach out to your assigned relocation coordinator. And if you're not sure who that is, your case manager is going to be able to help with that. And absolutely social. I forget about social media because I myself am not a big social media person, but those are excellent things to look out and get information from and good support groups also from, you know, from online resources. And, you know, like we said before, go to Facebook Live, go to our our LinkedIn pages, go to probably what other social media, because I'm not a social media person. What else do we have? Um, we have Facebook, yeah, and LinkedIn. Facebook, and even Instagram um, has oh, Instagram. pages yeah. dedicated to specific cities where they're constantly posting new things to do yeah. and people are trying to connect. Um, they have um, chat rooms and um, support rooms and um, different places where you can go and um, connect with other people. And also, I'll put in a plug for the candidate support specialist, too. You know, when you're arrived <laughs> here, we're here for you. Thanks, Stephanie. I'll put in a plug for her, too. <laughs> she is your candidate. She, Stephanie Tucker is our candidate support specialist, <laughs> and she will be there for you, everybody. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for, 
for all of your inputs. Next question. Um, this one is, uh, I think it's, it's an, a great question. Um, so the question is, how can I protect myself from racial discrimination? That is a sensitive topic. It, that, that's really hard. Uh, let me think on that one. Does anybody have an immediate thought? Well, I would go to my employee manual first and foremost, you know, and see what my company's policies are. Thank you. Employee handbook. Absolutely. Go to your HRD, go to your HR department. If you're experiencing what you think to be bullying or discrimination of any kind, absolutely. Please go there first. And they will, uh, there are many employee assistance programs and they will be a, your number one advocate and resource right away for them. Okay. All right. Awesome. Next one is, um, how do you overcome culture shock? I think this really looks different for every individual person. And I think that the time that it takes to get over the culture shock is going to be very, very individualized. Um, but I think that, you know, really way to come over, over, overcome the culture shock is to be excited. Be excited for your move. Be excited when you get here. Find fun things to do. Find fun things you want to go out and explore. Um, you know, here in North Carolina, there are some of the most beautiful hiking spots I have ever been to. And just to be able to go and get out in nature uh, makes me excited. When I moved here and you know, I, know, I didn't know anybody, um, even being out by myself, just being able to experience um, a new scene, um, kind of took me out of some of my loneliness and um, made me feel more connected even to myself. Um, but I think that um, being really excited for your journey and um, being excited for um, the big changes that you are making will really help you overcome that. And I think it'll look different for every person. Okay, thank you. And we're down with our last question. And this one is, um, question is how long does it take to acclimate? I think that that is also something that looks really individualized for every person. Um, but as a general rule, I mean, give it six months, six months, you need at least six months to acclimate to any situation, whether it's a new job or um, a new community or um, a new person that you're working with um, or settling into a new location. I think give it at least six months. I think that's a general rule for across the board with acclimating to any scenario in life is you have to give it at least six months um, to see where you're at and actively make changes to acclimate. If you know if what you're doing currently isn't working for you, make changes, see what else you can do, reach out to your support, reach out to your team here at Worldwide, reach out to your team um, at work um, and, and, and make changes to better help you um, overcome the acclimation period. Does anyone have anything to add to that? Yeah, I'm going to agree with that, Molly. I think six months is a, it's tough to put a timeline on that, but I will say, I think within a six month period, you're going to be in a far better mental headspace, emotional headspace. I think you will feel far more comfortable and feel more at home. And I, it, I think it probably took me a good six months just to get used to things. And we've talked about it before, but the sooner you prepare, the more that you do your research ahead of time, the sooner you can even connect before you even arrive to perhaps any groups that you can start communicating with, you know, so that you've already established a bit of a relationship by the time you come. That acclimation period might be a little bit less, but even the most prepared person, I would say probably a good six months. I agree. Okay, thank you. So those are all the questions from the chat. And also if you have more questions, don't hesitate to uh, reach out to your case manager, and uh, I assure you they can definitely help you with that. Also, um, you can always uh, reach out to any anyone from us from the team. And also, I, I would I would like to give a big thanks to Amy Reisman as uh, she's she's answering questions from the chat, and she's also a part of of the case management team. So um, I'm giving back the the microphone to Marlo. Thank you, CJ. I would also like to give a big shout out to Miss Amy Reisman on our chat today. She is the 
silent and quiet yet very present person. She's actually sitting right beside me today. We are really, really, really um, passionate, I'm gonna say, about culture shock. And we want you to reach out to your case manager and to your relocation and to your candidate support person because we have set these these people and these tools in place specifically so that we can make that a lot better for everyone. So again, we love our webinars. We have so much fun. Thank you to my team today again, Ms. Molly. This was, um, I think maybe your second webinar. This was Amy's first webinar. This was our Stephanie Tucker's first webinar today as well. And Christian, my, my sidekick and companion. Thank you, Christian, has been on several webinars. We really, really look forward to the next time that we can meet again. And in the meantime, stay safe. Thank you for all that you do. And reach out to your case manager if you have any questions or emergencies or problems. All right, everybody, take care.